Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bianca Durani, President and CEO of Aperio Philanthropy. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar today on decolonizing philanthropy. Aperio is a nonprofit consulting firm with a vision for a world in which everyone can thrive. We exist to unleash the power of communities to drive change by dramatically expanding resources for nonprofit organizations. Day to day, we work alongside community leaders and fundraisers to develop faster, simpler, smarter ways to generate revenue for important missions. And our client work provides strategic advisory, hands-on support, and embedded fundraisers to organizations nationwide. As a firm created to drive change, we are thrilled to be hosting this event series with New York University. For the past two years, we've been facilitating conversations among thought leaders about the role of philanthropy and fundraising in driving change and solving complex societal challenges. Today's webinar will address the heart of the question our community has been asking, how do we decolonize philanthropy? It's my pleasure now to introduce our co-host, Michelle D'Amico. Great, thanks Bianca. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle D'Amico and I'm the Director of Continuing Education and Public Programs at the NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs or CGA. Since its founding, our goal at CGA has been to prepare global citizens to make a positive impact in the world. We do this through a variety of activities, including our two graduate programs, one in global affairs and another MS in global security, conflict and cybercrime. We also offer a wide variety of skills and knowledge-based continuing education courses and offer public events such as this that expand upon the critical topics covered in our classrooms. We are very proud to be home to the George H. Heyman Junior Program for Fundraising and Philanthropy. Through our open enrollment courses and certificates in fundraising and digital fundraising, we offer professionally oriented educational options for those looking to enter or grow within the fundraising field. Courses are taught by practitioner faculty who bring their vast experience, expertise, and networks to the classroom. We'll send out a follow-up message to all attendees, so please feel free to reach out to us with any questions you may have. Additionally, we've reserved some time at the end of today's event for questions from the audience, so please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A tool. We are very grateful to host today's event. It's an important and critical topic, and we are honored to be joined by this stellar and impressive panel, including my colleague, George Settles, who will moderate today's conversation. In, ad in addition to teaching in our certificate and fundraising program, George serves as the executive director of the Common Fund Institute. And George, uh, without further ado, the virtual floor is all yours. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Bianca. I'm, I'm super excited to be here with all of you, and if, I feel like we've got a great group of panelists and a great group of, of, of attendees as well, as I see the attendance numbers uh, continue to grow. So just super excited to be in community with all of you. So I just wanna start by setting the stage really quickly um, uh, before, we jump into, uh, before we jump into the panel. So today's conversation will explore the role of philanthropy and social change, especially in advancing racial equity, racial justice and equity. Implicit in the title of our webinar, Decolonizing Philanthropy, is a shared understanding on this panel that philanthropy itself needs to change in order to realize its potential as a catalyst for social change. We see nonprofits and their philanthropic partners as part of the problem, complicit in systemic racism, and simultaneously as our best hope to change. And so our panelists will be sort of grappling and, 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 and framing this tension in a way um, that we hope will be generative for all of you as well. So while, you're, while you'll hear us be candid about challenges and problems in our sector, the focus of this conversation is where do we go from here? We'll begin by discussing what the term decolonization means in the context of philanthropy, why we need to pursue it and what it could look like. Then we'll discuss the big question, how do we do it? Finally, we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions of our panel. To begin, it's my pleasure to introduce this distinguished panel. Cynthia Hurd is the Chief Operating Officer of the Los Angeles Urban League with more than 25 years of experience in nonprofit management, public affairs, and philanthropy. Previously, she served as the Executive Vice President of the YWCA Greater Los Angeles, where she was elected to sit on several boards, including the California Women League of Voters, USC Black Alumni Association, and KIS Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us, Cynthia. 
Holly Lee is a founding partner at Radiant Strategies. She has dedicated her career to democratizing and diversifying the field and practice of philanthropy. She is a co-founder of the Donors of Color Network and is also the founder of the Asian Women Giving Circle, which raises resources for Asian American women using the arts to bring about social change in their NYC communities. Ricky Mananzala is the executive director at the New York Foundation and has been active in grassroots organizing, advocacy, and social justice philanthropy in service of racial, economic, and gender justice movements for more than two decades. He previously served as vice president of programs at Borealis Philanthropy. And finally, and something that's not in their bio, all three of them are, are, are friends, colleagues, uh, mentors, and heroes of mine. And so I'm incredibly grateful to all of them for, for letting me be a part of this, uh, of this conversation. Now that we've got everybody on camera, we're all here, the technology is working, the, the Wi-Fi is, is, is on a thousand and, and we, we feel confident we can move forward. Uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, so question for all of you, and I'll start with Holly first and then I want Cynthia and, and, and Ricky to jump in. Uh, to get us started, uh, share a little bit about your lens on the conversation um, that we'll be having today. What does decolonizing philanthropy mean to you and why does it matter? And as I mentioned, Holly, we'll start with you. Thanks, George. It's nice to see you again. And good, Cynthia, good Ricky, it's an honor to share the stage with you guys and Bianca and Michelle and NYU and Aperio. Thank you for having us all on um, to have lunch with y'all out here on the yeah. Zoom in the Zoom world. So any conversation around decolonizing, I think, has to pay homage to our dear friend Edgar. This is his book, and he wrote a really important book in our sector. Um, please go get it. Um, we can share the link later, Decolonizing Wealth. And I'll just read a tiny bit because I think that really gets to the sum of what we're going to talk about today. Um, and then I'll add one sentence about my take on it. Um, so in the introduction, Edgar writes, money is like water. Water can be a precious life-giving resource. But what happens when water is dammed or when a water cannon is fired on protesters in sub-zero temperatures? Money should be a tool of love to facilitate relationships to help us thrive rather than to hurt and divide us. If it's used for sacred life-giving restorative purposes, it can be medicine. Money used as medicine can help us decolonize. There's something so important in there about how money is just a tool. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in exploring with you guys and also in my work is how part of what I think we're doing is reconnecting with the cultural heritages that we all have in our past. Um, that give us the, the ground, the roots from which we do this work. I'm Korean American. In my culture, we have something called a ge. Um, I have friends who are from the Western parts of Africa or West India, and they call them susus or isusus. My Mexican friends call them tandas. Um, all of us have something in our past, our cultural heritages, our endowments that I think we can all reconnect to in order to make our sector less white, less focused on rich people, less focused on sometimes in some cases that we all know dead rich people. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, George. Thanks so much, Holly. Uh, Cynthia, I wanna bring you in. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, thank you, George. And thank you to the incredible panel here. You know, to decolonize the way we donate, the way we view philanthropy is really to relinquish that control and trust the process of organizations receiving funds. So, you know, to me, decolonizing philanthropy must involve an intersectional lens uh, that takes into account issues of gender, age, religion, and ethnicity. And philanthropists should prioritize inclusion of the most vulnerable groups in our society and incorporate them into the strategy and design all funding initiatives. And this is very, very important. Absolutely, thanks so much, Cynthia. Ricky, uh, what about you? What are your thoughts, sir? Thanks, George. And wow, uh, being on this panel with Cynthia and Holly is just um, really humbling. So I'm just so so happy to be here with all of you. Um, so my lens, as you, as George introduced me, as uh, my roots are as a community organizer. So how I think about this work is my um, history and social justice movements. And so how I approach my current role at the New York Foundation and philanthropy more generally is remembering what it's like to be a grant seeker and the challenges I face in resourcing work led by young people of color. I've seen firsthand how philanthropy has wielded its power, as we'll talk about today, in ways that have been harmful to organizations and ultimately movements, whether that be by underinvesting in BIPOC-led organizations, creating competition for resources amongst allied groups, by creating funding priorities that dictate rather than facilitate. As Holly said, decolonizing philanthropy ultimately means we have to right the wrongs. Um, it's going to require honest reflection, followed by, more, most importantly, 
action um, to shift the status quo. And thankfully, there are plenty of opportunities to do this um, and those that are already doing it, which I'm excited to talk about today. Um, but why, why does it matter? I mean, I think I'm saying the obvious here, but it needs to be said. I think if ultimately we want organizations and movements to succeed, we have to resource this work in a way that shifts power from philanthropy to the grassroots. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and Ricky, that last part, you know, it, it all resonates with me, but that last part, I want to sort of shift. And I want to, Cynthia, I want to get your um, take on this. So a cornerstone of decolonized philanthropy is more connection, more conversation, more love, more trust, more generosity, as you all sort of alluded to and, and, and touched on. So it also includes, if we're going to espouse all of those sentiments, then that's going to require a much bigger role for communities in directing how resources are used. So Cynthia, a question for you. Share with us your vision for how community leaders, nonprofits, funders, and other shareholders uh, can work together more effectively with all of those sentiments underpinning the work. You know, with the uprise of the previous events uh, over the past, what, two, three years, with social, the social rise of all the injustices, COVID, um, you know, in 2020 to reinforce how desperately a paradigm shift is needed in philanthropy, if it hopes to create a more doable solutions to the world's most collect, co complex challenges. You know, during COVID-19, the pandemic revealed how important it is to have agile, innovative organizations and capable of responding to quickly to shifting local context. And at that same time, the awakening of the social justice movement crystallized what happened when people are chronically underrepresented and left out of the decisions that affect their lives. And while addressing, addressing these challenges, um, it seems overwhelming, but it's clear one of the most effective ways that funders can contribute is to support organizations built around the community-driven solutions and not leaving communities out of the decisions. And why is this so important? Because solutions for the people created by the people have the greatest chances of successfully changing the status quo and to ensure greater progress towards a shared prosperity and decolonizing uh, philanthropy presents an opportunity to make every dollar go further by centering investment in community-driven solutions. And you know, George, there's three ways that funders can ensure their investments are more efficient, more effective, and equitable. And that's to invest in the local leadership and programs co-designed in the community served. And also fund the collaborations rather than having agencies compete against one another for that very same dollar. And you know, the current donor incentive structure is rooted in competition. There's only so many dollars on the plate. And why is it that all of us should compete for that very same dollar, really making it against one another? And organizations in the same field are constantly competing to secure the dollars they need to survive. So real tangible impact requires collaboration. And of course, you know, award that unrestricted funding. We know that, you know, Mackenzie Scott did it the best. You know, she sat out there and she let everybody know that by giving away her Amazon wealth and saying that, you know, it's, it's important in supporting the anti-racism work um, led by people of color and also her self-awareness. So we should all toast to Mackenzie Scott, in my opinion for shattering the philanthropic gas glass ceiling uh, with unprecedented giving uh, in forms of such large unrestricted uh, grants. So, you know, in my opinion, where does this leave us? And my hopes is that the rest of philanthropy moves towards this model of wealth distribution. I know this kind of radical change cannot happen in a vacuum. And we know that, especially for black folks, indigenous and other people of color, but, you know, it does have institutionalized impact of racism in every aspect, in every aspect of individuals' lives. So that's that's my take on that. Absolutely, thanks, Cynthia. And I love the way you just sort of outlined that and gave us the keys to the kingdom. So it's really important to sort of provide direction. So I really appreciate you um, uh, on that front as well. Um, Holly, I, I wanna come to you because Cynthia touched on a lot of amazing points, but one of the things that she, a through line, um, a through line for her comments really focused on 
a bigger role for communities to discuss how resources are directed. And for you, Holly, a lot of your work has complements that because it says not only should communities have a seat at the table, but communities can be philanthropic and organize philanthropic dollars to support their own. And so your research has explored this shift to a more collective democratized approach to philanthropy. So describe to us what, what, what that could look like. Well, I can say it in one sentence, honestly. It's like, we can, let's build the party that we wanna be at. Mm. You know? And if this party hasn't been built for us, we certainly can demand multiple seats around that table, but we can also build our own institutions. We can build our own abundance. We can build on the abundance that's in, in all of our communities and cultures and families. So I'm gonna cheers to Cynthia because ditto everything. She, absolutely, I'm my absolutely. And I'm also <laughs> gonna cheers Mackenzie because she is throwing things kind of blowing things up in a very amazing kind of way that's not like a Molotov cocktail. It's like kind of inviting in a, in a weird way, even though she doesn't, I would love it actually if she would want to be in a little bit more relationship with the folks she's funding, but I really just appreciate just like the urge to get the fl dollars flowing. Um, embedded in what Ricky and Cynthia have both said so far is this idea of moving from a me to a we, like moving from an individual hero stance um, which is a deep part of American culture, for better or for worse, you know, to a we position, like the power of a collective, because together we are so much more powerful than the sum of our parts. Um, I'm writing a book on this that I'm having so much fun doing called The Big We, just on this very idea told through lots of stories of people doing collective giving around the country. Um, and so in addition to like, you know, starting the helping to build the donors of color network, which is an example of let's build our own table. You know, none of the donor networks that exist in America thus far have meaningfully integrated their membership to include the growing millions of people out there who are people of color with a lot of wealth. None of them have, have meaningfully integrated their networks. Think about that. You know, this is 2023. So Irva Shivad, Shindy Maxson, and I took on this research project that eventually became a network. And it was to build a philanthropic home not for everyone, but for those donors of color who had the means and the desire to come together in a cross uh, race, cross ethnicity, cross life experience um, place to move not all dollars, but some of our dollars towards um, issues, causes, movements that are building um, more freedom, justice, equity, opportunity um, for all, you know, as enshrined in the founding documents of our country. Like, what does that look like? How can we make that dream more real? Because it certainly hasn't been real to this point. Um, so there's that whole body of work, which I can talk at length about. George was part of that first team around the table at Irvishi's um, office, thinking about what this might look like. George was part of the beginning research of this research project. And the second thing I'll wanna just put a pin in for later is giving circles, collective giving. Um, I started the Asian Women Giving Circle like 17 years ago, all volunteers. Um, we've moved one and a half million dollars to 80 amazing projects in New York City, all led and run by Asian American women and gender expansive folks. And it's been a total blast. And this is something everyone can do. And it's inspired by this idea of a Korean ge. After the 2016 presidential election, I joined my first political giving circle. That network of giving circles has moved, I think $6 million last cycle, which was an off presidential year cycle to flip state legislatures from red to blue. These are normal, regular everyday citizens, um, not uber wealthy, um, around the country who are trying to exert the lever of political influence as do individual donors, which individual donors can exert all the levers available to us, right? To move change that we wanna see in the world. So I'm really moved by, inspired by that collective effort um, to move our collective power in a, in a political arena. Absolutely, thanks Holly. Ricky, wanna bring you in. Um, you have a unique um, sort of perspective and that you've been an organizer, you've been, you've, you've been, you, you've got this incredible multi-dimensional lens and now you're at the helm of the New York Foundation. So as an institutional funder, what's your, how are you sort of absorbing your vantage point and what are you seeing? Yeah, you know, and as I think about our role and, and you, know, um, you know, supporting social change and where philanthropy has been and where it's going, I think we, like I said, you know, what we have, and I think Holly said this to Edgar's books, that the, the resources are 
And the money we have are the tools and power we have to support change. And so how do we choose to wield our power? It's something I think about all the time. It's how I opened. I share some, shared some challenging examples that I remember from being an organizer and, and fundraiser. Um, but I think there's, uh, we can kind of shift how we think about um, how we wield our power. And, and I think, you know, Cynthia kicked off with the, the most obvious, but it has to continually be said, like the drumbeat around multi-year general operating support and the concept of trust-based philanthropy um, is actually something I experienced first from being a grant recipient of the New York Foundation. I didn't really understand what philanthropy was. It was my, my first relationship with a funder um, that I actually felt like in a conversation um, when we were trying to get funding for our work took us seriously as young people of color. And that experience alone, um, I, can't, I can't describe how profound it was um, compared to some of my other experiences where we either couldn't get access to resources, couldn't get in the door. I understand the frustration of maybe many of you on this um, webinar today is like, what is a foundation? Like when I when I hear this um, term, which I loathe, when you know one foundation, you know one foundation because everyone's got different priorities. I, I think our role is to demystify how we work, be more transparent um, and create more accessibility and understanding about um, how we fund the work that we fund. I think there's some really interesting work that I know you're involved in um, George, it's it's how do how do foundations actually think about leveraging all their resources in alignment with their mission and values? Holly talked about this really briefly, but you know, for those of us that are private foundations like the New York Foundation, which sits on an endowment that's invested in, in the stock market, um, we're mostly only talking about our grant making dollars that's going to primarily startup BIPOC led organizations, which we're proud of. Um, but we're only recently turning an eye to well, how how are our resources invested? Um, and and how is that actually in alignment, not only with our mission and values, but how can we actually make it more like shifting power in how we think about our grant making? Like, how can we start thinking about how our endowments are actually moving more in alignment with movements and social justice values? Not just the easy stuff, not just the low-hanging fruit, which is important, but actually some great examples to share here, like with the work of justice funders um, and their just transitions framework, moving away from extractive ways of investing in the economy to more regenerative ways, or the Center for Economic Democracy's work around the social movement investing framework. I'll drop a few of these in the chat box. I think there's just really exciting ways that foundations should be interrogating their relationship, not only to how we move the money to the groups we're supporting, yes, that's it, but how are we also listening to those groups and communities about how we invest all of our resources? I think these are a few great examples. Um, that I put in the chat box. And I would think for those of you that are in philanthropy um, on this webinar, I encourage you if you're not already familiar with these, these frameworks to think just like you're maybe turning a more, um, you know, uh, critical eye to your grant making and your priorities uh, because of this movement moment, moment has pushed us to do that. But how are we also thinking about our endowments and, and the resources and how they're invested? I think one last thing I might add in our role as funders and something I'm thinking about is how do we actually shift the mindset of you know, program officers and people like me that have the ability to control the flow of resources. Um, again, using my organizer mindset and remembering what it's like to be a fundraiser, you know, program officers are gatekeepers of resources. You know, funders are gatekeepers of resources. So how do we shift the role of a program officer and start to think of themselves as not just, not gatekeepers, but facilitators and fundraisers and organizers of their peers to get them to move more money to our grantees, right? To the groups we're supporting. So as we think about the role of a program officer at the New York Foundation, we're inspired by our other philanthropic peers, such as the Marguerite Casey Foundation, who's actually rewrote their program officer job description and said a program officer's role is to actually help their grantees leverage more relationships with other funders they might not yet have access to. So I'm constantly thinking about how do we use our power, wield our power, and service of the groups we're supporting, especially those that have been historically divested or underinvested in or overlooked by philanthropy. And that's explicitly black led organizations, trans led organizations, and startup groups, which is the priority of the New York Foundation. Absolutely. Thanks, Ricky. So I just want to synthesize our thoughts really quickly. And it may be imperfect because you all dropped a lot of gems. Um, so what I'm hearing is abundant mindset, right? Understanding that our communities have assets and can participate in philanthropy and can strategically deploy resources. And so we can shift a power dynamic by just activating our own power. Two, institution building. How do we build our own? Sort of related to that first comment, right? Um, three, and we'll touch on this, is that, you know, there are, we are within institutions and how do we think more proactively about reimagining our role within institutional philanthropy 
And then finally, and Cynthia touched on this uh, very eloquently, is focusing on community and community leaders um, and empowering and activating them to make decisions around how resources are deployed and used. And so they are the closest to, um, they're, they're the closest, to, they're on the ground. And so the folks on the ground are, 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 closer, to the, are closer to the solutions. Um, shout out to Glenn Martin who, uh, who coined that phrase many, many years ago. Um, I wanna get into it, right? So there's great energy around these conversations. And so I'm going to, they're, they're more nuanced, but I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put these conversations in two camps, right? The first camp is um, disruptive, burn it all down, right? It's all broken, none of it works. You know, the, the systems are fractured, burn, them all, burn it all down, right? Um, and I get where that energy, I get that energy. And then the uh, there's another camp that says, well, you know, change needs to happen more incrementally. There's got to, you know, and so how do we fix and, and tend to these broken systems and eventually get them to a, a, a better place? I fall kind of in the middle where I'm like, burn it all down and let's play sort of an inside outside game, right? They're, in, they're existing institutions. How do we mend and tend to them? And then also how do we um, think revolutionary about uh, in a revolutionary way around all of this. So I, I, I want you all to, 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 to join me in that middle space, right? Where it's the burn it all down and how do we fix, how do we fix some of this stuff? So Holly, you wanna, wanna uh, go to you. How do you think about, uh, 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 how do you think in that middle space, right? Between burn it all down and, uh, you know, tend to the, uh, the existing institutions, what's working? W what are you encouraged about? I'm kind of with you in the middle there, George, a little, you know, um, I'm going to quote my friend and colleague Farhad Ibrahimi, who runs the Chorus Foundation, and he he's way more rad than I am. I admire him a lot. And he says that, in his words, philanthropy and what he does is a transitional form. Mm. And I love the way he thinks about this because he has a vision for a world in which there aren't, there isn't the wealth disparity that we have now, you know, that there aren't. The, that the wealth in America, 80% of the um, 30 plus millionaires in America are white. You know, like there's just, there's so many problematic things about how wealth is distributed in our country. And Farhad, um, as, as his vision is removed from what we can do tomorrow, right? So he's thinking about his work as a transitional form. And I love that because it's inviting to change, but also acknowledging that change takes time. Um, Inside outside is one of my favorite um, frames. Um, as an example, um, my dear friend and, and colleague in this work is Elaine Martin, who runs um, the wealthy donor group at Fidelity Charitable. Um, we've known each other. We met each other at a Women Moving Millions conference where we were the only two women in that very fancy ballroom who weren't white. So of course we found each other <laughs> at the table, at the food, the buffet table, and have been friends ever since. And um, I've been developing this curriculum um, that's aimed at moving dollars faster to movements and leaders on the ground who were doing the work. Um, Aim, this curriculum is aimed squarely at the wealthiest, livingest donors we can find. And um, we're calling it Freedom School for Philanthropy as a direct homage to Fannie Lou Hamer and the work of Black leaders of the Civil Rights Movement and Freedom Summer. And each of us in this work, um, you know, we're Indian American, Korean American, Black American, White American, we're articulating our own personal journeys into this work because we must as step one. And we're asking the wealthy donors that we're trying to move and, um, and, and come together um, to do the same. And um, this curriculum, we built it on the guidance and wishes of movement leaders. You know, we interviewed um, 20, two dozen people, um, more than half of whom are movement leaders and organizers and asked them, if you could think about those relationships with individual donors you've had that have been, um, dare I say, transformative, you know, and not just transactional. Um, describe the attributes of that relationship and then describe the relationships that haven't been so mutually affirming and rewarding and doing good in the world and describe those and help us build more of that first kind of individual wealthy donor and family foundation donor. And so with their wishes and guidance are the founding DNA of this curriculum that we built. And, um, 
that's an ins- that's an example of an inside outside game too, right? Because the mm. indiv- we interviewed you know very famous people like Ai Jin Poo and Vanessa Daniel and Insei Ufad and Anna Theachino and also some not famous people who run really important small organizations in various cities around the country, and they they said some of the same things that the individual donors um, we interviewed said, and it's what you guys have all touched on. Like no one is happy with a rela- philanthropic relationship that is mostly transactive. No one likes that. It's icky for everyone. It's icky for the program officer. It's icky for the donor. And it's icky for the person that's trying to get that money, You know, the person doing the work. It's icky for everyone. All of the people in that little ecosystem want a relationship that is more aligned around values and vision for the change we want to see in the world. And that leads towards this transformation, you know? So those of us who can have to work the inside to get to that vision, and those of us, there's also a role for um, activists and holding up placards and and disrupting things. And, you know, I've certainly done that in various times in my career as well. Um, but sorry, George, I lost the thread about fidelity, but that, that was an example of an inside outside thing too, because gotcha. we had a relationship with Elaine, which allowed us to work directly with some of the individual donors at fidelity with this, um, curriculum that we're piloting this year at the same time that I can be supportive of other organizers who are trying to unmask fidelity say right and be more upfront about where their dollars are going like I support that effort too but because I have access because of my tenure and age I'm an old lady at this point in the sector um, my role can be in this moment to try to organize a little bit from the inside Absolutely. No, that's a great example, Holly. Thanks for sharing that. So Cynthia, I want to turn to you because you, um, t- you've you been touching on this throughout your comments. So what opportunities do you see for people of color to lead change as philanthropists themselves? You know, there's opportunities for us to activate our own resources. Well, you know, the question is how can donors of color, Black folk, uh, folk of color sustain funding when they remain on the front line of the issues ranging from racial justice to climate crisis, you know, and what are the strategies in place to encourage new donors in black and brown community or black and brown philanthropy. And, you know, despite the racial wealth gap, black and brown donors are prioritizing funding. We know in education, health, social justice, women and gender rights, and donors of color are giving to not only assist nonprofit organizations, but also empowering the communities. communities. Oh, Cynthia, you're muted. Cynthia, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. What must change is the narrative. That's what must change. We have to stop seeing philanthropy as a white narrative. And since black households have outpaced giving white households and growing number of black donors giving nonprofits reasons to be optimistic about the future of giving. And although more can be done to cultivate them, you know, we've got a growing number of black foundations, businesses engaged in community foundations and giving. But, you know, we have, well, there's a whole black giving ecosystem and we need them all, and we need them to all collaborate together. But it, there's no mystery here. We are very proud that the Black community is doing our job, and folks of color, we're doing our job, but we still have, there's so much more to do. And the interesting part about Black philanthropy is that it survived because there's always been a need for it, a need to give, a need to give back to the community a need to assert the vision in philanthropy. And so, you know, my thought about this is to continue to do what we've been doing and to really continue to to be at that pivotal point and to support the movements and to under, and, and really, like I said, to just change this narrative, thinking that, non-folk of color or, or white people are the only folks that are playing this game. You know, black folk, brown folk, Asians, uh, the transgender community, the LGBT community, we're in these trenches and we're out here raising money like no other. And so I, I don't think that, 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 that model is broken. 
I think that we can just keep doing what we're doing. And I think we're doing a darn good job about it. It's just that we have to be better at letting everybody know what we're doing. And I know um, that uh, in that conversation, um, I'll let Holly talk a little bit more about those statistics because I think people just don't know that narrative and will be shocked to know the types of work and the types of dollars that were, for example, spent at the African American Museum, anywhere from one to $20 million. You know, it's changing the narrative and really educating. Absolutely. Cynthia, what you, sh you sharing that uh, 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 inspires me to share sort of an effort that I'm a part of. And Holly, there, I pay homage to you around this as well. Uh, last year, I got with a group of young Black professionals and we started the New York City Racial Equity Endowment Fund. So that's us take pooling our own, uh, you know, resources together. You know, none of us are rich, but we take our resources, we pull them together, and we support Black-led non nonprofits here in New York City. And so there is real power in, you know, activating our own philanthropy. We don't need to rely on institutional funders or older white men as philanthropists to support this work we can organize our own resources in a way that can be impactful. So I just uh, wanted to share that. You inspired me in that regard. So thank you. Can I jump in, George? It's such a good segue to this. Sure, go for sure, it. Yeah, but then I want to make sure we get Ricky too, because yeah, he's Ricky, chomping, sorry, at the bit, chomping at the bit. You, come, you, you, you can take my next one, whatever. <laughs> no, 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 all good, all good. <laughs> um, to you. Um, so, you know, um, Irv and Shindy and I wrote this report called um, Philanthropy always sounds like someone else, a portrait of high net worth donors of color. And to Cynthia's point, so this report encompasses themes and stories from 113 wealthy individuals of color across the country. And I've gotten to interview 150, the funnest thing ever. I mean, I would, I could do this till I die. It was so much fun to get to do this work. I've been able to interview 150 wealthy folks of color across the country at this point. And, but just the 113 in here, I'll share two statistics that get to exactly what Cynthia is saying. If you, the average annual giving of the 113 people in this report, the average annual giving was around $87,000 per year. 22%, almost a quarter of the people that we interviewed reported liquid net assets north of $30 million. Almost a quarter of the people we interviewed in this report reported liquid net assets north of $30 million. We are, ourselves were surprised by the wealth because we had our own biases about what we would find. Um, we had to revise our wealth bubbles that you check off upwards because the people we were finding and interviewing were so wealthy and we weren't going for the well-known people i mean i mean if lebron had called me i would have hopped the next plane to wherever he was and interviewed <laughs> him. but we weren't going for the oprah's and lebron's we were trying to find the millionaire next door so most of the people everyone no one in this report maybe one you would have heard of but most of the people you you haven't heard their name so just to sh second what cynthia said there's a ton of wealth not it's untapped. Many, many of these people are not involved in philanthropic networks. They're super networked, but they're very much not networked philanthropically. Um, so there's a ton, there's a ton there that we can talk about another time. Ricky, over to you. Absolutely, absolutely. Ricky, please share, share your drop your gems, sir. Drop your gems. Right. Well, first, Holly, I'll always cede my time to you, Ashindi and Irvishi. <laughs> Rest in peace and power, Irv. Yeah. Um, I uh, you know, I think so in terms of like you know, on the institutional side of philanthropy, how do funders change? I think my prompt is also like, how do we keep the momentum or even pressure for change we're seeing in the philanthropy is the past couple of years, there's been really exciting um, statements, right? About commitments to racial justice and equity, to you know, um, shifting restrictions on funding to more multi-year general operating support. These massive changes we saw in a short amount of time was really inspiring. And then just you know, a couple of years later, we're starting to see some rollbacks at some of those shifts. Um, and so, I think first is um, you know moving from statements to action is, is certainly something I know we all want. That's a, that's the basic starting point. But I actually think there's a little bit more to that. It, it's the, the action that matters, yes, but more specifically the transparency about how we're doing to the commitments we said in our statements, and not just the good stuff. I think actually what's more interesting is where philanthropy has fallen short. There's some great examples uh, of um, folks that are doing and putting out there more transparently what they're funding, how they're funding, what they've learned, what they've changed, but also um, not as many like, hey, here's what we said, here's actually how we're doing, and here's where we've fallen short. I think the Katali Foundation, I'll, I'll just put one here, some great reflections they've shared 
um, as a foundation on a number of things, really like celebrating about the, you know, transparently what they failed at, um, I think is a, is a great example. Um, you know, what foundations, foundations can start doing more of, which is built on this idea of more transparency, demystifying what we're doing as foundations, as I said earlier, how to access our funding, among other things. I think another area where we can kind of pressure, put the pressure on, really, I think it's it's coming from many of you, I think, actually on this webinar that are on the grant recipient and fundraising side of things is continue to put the pressure on us as funders. There is a power dynamic there. It's easier said than done. But I know philanthropy is listening. They, we do not want to be held up as examples of gate, as gatekeepers to resources. We want to, many of us actually want to be true to our commitments and we need to open ourselves up to criticism. So I'd say for those of you on the call is to be, uh, again, in, in fundraising and, and nonprofit positions, um, is to work with your peers. And as Cynthia said earlier, and I mentioned in my opening, I've seen how funders create competition amongst peers and actually it's divisive and it, it waters down the work. So how can you come together as partners and approach a funder and say, hey, this we're competing for these resources and here's actually how that's diminishing our power, right? And then finally, I think, like I said earlier, the way I think about the role of program officers and those of us in foundations um, to keep the momentum going around the shifts is to organize our peers, provide concrete opportunities for how they can change. Listen, um, yes, there's gonna be some, um, you know, it takes time, right? And many funders are, hesitant to make major shifts in how they support. I think, um, you know, thinking about how the New York Foundation often is the first funder in funding startup groups when most other funders um, won't, you know, aren't ready to support you know, uh, startup organizations, I think very much is our role. So I'm thinking constantly, like, how do I introduce not just this group um, to a funder as they become more established, but how do I get this funder to start thinking about um, being more capable, like uh, from an infrastructure perspective, but also from a values perspective and funding more startup organizations. And if they're not there yet, how can I introduce them to an intermediary organization that is capable of doing that so they can recognize the importance of these groups, which are historically black led organizations, people of color led organizations and communities that are doing the work um, with the fewest amount of resources. And I'm really tired of those groups saying and being celebrated for doing so much with so little. Uh, and so I think a lot of keeping the momentum is saying our role in philanthropy as our peers is, is in organizing each other. Absolutely. Thanks, Ricky. Thanks. Um, the Q&A box is on fire. So do you all mind if we transition to Q&A? Because some of these questions are juicy and I want to I, I want to. Um, I want to get your takes on it. So I'll, 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 I'll jump into um, the first question. So if philanthropy is to be decolonized, then donors need to have more conversations with grantees. But so many can only get in by invitation. So um, there are only but so many grantees that can get a seat at the table. How can the donors work harder to get to the doers and lower the barriers to entry for new potential grantees? And Ricky, I'll start with you and then go Cynthia and Holly. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I like the the paradigm shift here, right? As donors actually should be seeking out the relationships and the work more proactively rather than passively waiting for groups to seek them out. And given the power imbalance, um, I think actually the way I ended earlier to say like donors actually need to be seeking out networks and organizing themselves and finding their peers and finding their communities and to some extent their political home identifying with other folks that maybe are further along on their journey of identifying their priorities and relationships with groups on the ground. Obviously, Donors of Color Network is a great place to not only be building community amongst like-minded donors, um, but also to be um, strategizing on where to move those resources. Solidaire is another great example. We can start putting some of these links in the chat box in a moment. Um, and resource generation for young people with wealth, finding community, doing the political education, understanding the source of their wealth and, and identifying how to not only redistribute their resources, but where to identify where the resources are most needed. Again, finding those networks and communities to connect you uh, with those folks on the ground and building right relationships um, with those groups. Cynthia, what are your thoughts? I want to bring you in. Well, you know, donors have to have access, but I think what has happened, and Ricky, you know, I love you. But uh, foundations, it's, it's like some anomaly. And it's so it really puts folks out there that really truly uh, need those dollars. It makes it, it makes it very difficult. And you know what? Doing a dog and pony show for two or three dollars really takes away 
uh, one's desire to even start doing the dance. And so those donors that would like to have a better opportunity, you know, they need to reach out and begin working amongst themselves and working in a way that can help um, move towards the community. The community isn't going anywhere. The need isn't going anywhere. You can just actually reach out and touch. We don't often have to uh, have that, that barrier between um, donor and community. But I'll tell you something, you know, what we, we also have to realize that when there's an issue, you know, everybody was blowing up LA, the streets were on fire. My goodness, the Grove, they went and robbed the Grove. Everybody says, oh my word, I've got to reach out. I've got to make a difference. They found a way then. But when it's all said and done and got quiet, um, where are you? We're still here. We haven't gone anywhere. The needs are still here. So, you know, that, that's really my take on it. I think it's, it's, a, it's a, we have to restructure the dance. We have to restructure the dance. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Holly, what, what are your thoughts? I just, I don't have a lot to add. I mean, to add to the great group that Ricky if, um, mentioned, if you're a little bit more of a beginner on this journey, I would say go to your local community foundation or find a woman's foundation in your town because they aggregate and know a lot about the organizations doing good work in that town in your town or your area or your neighborhood. And it's an efficient way for an, a new donor or a middle, you know, starting a journey donor to get to know about the nonprofits in that area. And it's a good question though, like that Cynthia is raising about efficiency like typically in our sector we've talked about like what's efficient for the donor especially if you're a big donor but if we flip it and ask what's efficient for the ed what's efficient for the executive director what's efficient for that nonprofit that's trying to raise money and what's most efficient for them is to get in touch with a collaborative because then a donor collaborative is like an aggregator of a lot of different donors and so if you're an ed getting you know into that world is like a great idea because then it's just so much more efficient for the person who's trying to raise the money and one story to share i interviewed ijen pu um, who's a MacArthur Award you know, genius and runs the National Domestic Workers Alliance for this Freedom School for Philanthropy curriculum. She told me she spends upwards of 80% of her time fundraising and she's a MacArthur genius. <laughs> and, and iGen's genius is strategy and organizing. And it's a tragedy that she's spending 80% of her time. I mean, I could have caught her on a bad day, but clearly the gist is the gist. Um, <laughs> 80% of her time on fundraising. You know, she has so little time to strategize her organization and virtually zero time to strategize with other people in adjacent um, bodies of work to bring our movements together and moving and move us forward. That's wrong. So whatever we can do on the resource side to free up more time for someone like I did to have more time to strategize and spend less time fundraising, we should do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Sorry, the, the Q&A box is... is lit up so i'm trying to um synthesize george synthesize. i'm trying i'm trying my best <laughs> we, we've got we've got uh really really engaged you know highly brilliant folks on this so the questions are so complex and i'm like Ugh, okay um here's one that i think is really in interesting and that sort of like is, a, is is existential to the field so cynthia mentioned the pitfalls of competition for donor dollar so for the panel what are your thoughts on sort of philanthropy's relationship to capitalism and the nonprofit industrial complex and how can we move forward when this when these structures are so intertwined and complex uh, I'll start with you Holly since we ended with you what are your what are your thoughts about all I know it's a, it's a difficult question but it's an important one for at least to, for us to at least grapple with so if you think about a Venn diagram of different ways that we can influence the world according in accordance with our values, there's the civic sector, which is like philanthropy, which is about a $450 billion world. And then if you compare that to what the dollars moved in the capital markets, how many is it, George? It's trillions of dollars. Trillions, tens of trillions. Then, right, of trillions. and then government dollars is another couple trillion or whatever. 
philanthropy is like tiny. So if you're an individual wealthy donor, sure, you can spend all your time and energy trying to move this tiny little lever. But the benefit of being a family, an individual, like some of us working in C3s are more constrained as a C3, but individuals can try to exert our influence on all of these different levers, you know, like time, talent, treasure, testimony, ties to like move your electeds, work for tax reform, you know, work on all the bigger lever things at the same time that you're working on um, your philanthropy. That's how we address this um, philanthropy as a transitional form thing right now, right? Is to try to do our best to make tax, tax policy dwarfs the dollars moved in philanthropy, right? So I'll stop there. Got you. Cynthia, I want to bring you in. What are your thoughts to this very complex question? Well, you know, we asked those naysayers to take a critical look at how this is all rooted in kind of a, an imperialistic uh, mindset that blames communities um, in the needs of their problems. And rather than seeing them as the solution for the problems. And so, you know, I, I tread lightly on this one. I, I, tread, I tread lightly on this and I will defer the rest to Ricky. Uh, I'll I'll stay with just that. Got you. I, I see that uh, twinkle you, in your eye, <laughs> Cynthia. We're gonna have to get on another private Zoom. I, I need I need whatever whatever else is uh, going on in your, in that mind of yours. I need that. But uh, but I understand. We will we will we will move on. Ricky, what are your what are your thoughts? Well, you mean like how do we undo capitalism and the nonprofit industrial complex? I mean, yes, it's like a please. very simple in, in, question. In, in, okay. 30, in, in, in 30 to yeah. 45 seconds, I'm, if you could answer that I'm question, like, that would be great. I'm like Cynthia, give it a hard pass. But what I'll say, I will say <laughs> on this is, you know, what are groups doing as alternatives? I think just like there are interesting models for giving right now, like Mackenzie Scott, there are groups that are saying this system is so broken, we're not even going to play in it. We're going to come up with our own alternative ways of funding our work that goes beyond the individual donor and the institutional donor, thinking about not becoming nonprofits altogether, being, yep. we're seeing more LLCs, we're seeing more um, just cooperatives, um, um, for-profit ventures that folks are building in their communities. And I'm like, I'm looking at that. I'm like, I'm excited about, I think that to this question is not how do we operate within this kind of broken system, but what are groups doing to challenge it, both on the philanthropic side and resourcing how they resource their work, but also like just on a practical level, logistically, the organizations that we're starting to see at that very micro level in New York, so interesting and do not fit within the nonprofit industrial complex um, uh, kind of uh, system. Absolutely. So Holly, I want to circle back to something that you talked about. It's just sort of like when we're, yeah, and, and, and Ricky and Cynthia will resonate with you when we talk about the organizing and advocacy piece, right? Is that, can we elevate our advocacy, for example, to demand more transparency and donor advised funds, for example, right? And, and, and advocate for for more accelerated disbursement of resources coming out of DAFs. And so that's something where we can educate ourselves about and play that inside outside game, right? And so for folks who have access to DAFs, encourage donors to release funds uh, you know, in, at an accelerated pace. And then also at the federal level say, hey, we want more transparency around donor advised funds. We wanna understand how that vehicle's being used in a philanthropic way and then encourage accelerated disbursement. And so. It, that that's another as we are, as we're all talking that's another really good example of that inside outside game holly you mentioned fidelity 100%. right they're like the second largest or maybe even the largest, the largest. DAF, daf platform and so how do we use our friends on the inside and say hey yeah. we need to work on this while at the same time you know um advocating and organizing for more transparency and accelerated disbursement so and who's going to be the best organizer to try to move fidelity which is right. full of really good people and but they're not allowed to um, opine on some of these legislative efforts right around DAFs. the best people to organize within fidelity are fidelity's DAF holders the fidelity wealth holders themselves i think so if we have access to those guys and we can do what we can to to flip a few of them into that organizing role, because organizing is everything, um, then that's that's the play, you know. Um, I also really like what some people like Lem White at Possibility Labs, what he's doing, you know. So he's got a DAF, he's doing all the complicated financial stuff that I can't think about because it makes my head explode. So he's building these structures. So I'm like, thank you, Lem, because then I don't have we don't have to figure it out. You're figuring out all this hard 
hard stuff. So he's building a DAF structure where you're rewarded for giving more of it away within a certain time frame, and you're not allowed to keep it in a DAF, keep your resources in a DAF beyond a certain time frame. I don't remember what it is. So it's trying. He's trying to do both um, by building the vehicle for donors who are aligned with getting. There's so many things to spend it on. Let's get it out the door now. Um, and he's and he's built a financial. Um, infrastructure to support that movement to keep that money flowing absolutely absolutely uh I, i'm gonna offer apologies to our community out there we're at time um but there are so many good questions in the in the chat we should have um note note to our collective selves this is an hour and a half two hour conversation but we all, we've only got a, we, we didn't have that much time so apologies to uh, folks out there if i didn't get to your really good questions uh, so apologies um let's let's bring it on home so uh for each of you in a sentence or two what's the biggest takeaway that you want this community uh, uh, uh to leave with um ricky i'll start with you and then i'll go holly and then cynthia i want to give you the last word Thanks, George. I'm gonna actually use my time instead of that piece is to, there's one question we missed that I wanted to highlight. So work that I'm feeling inspired by, so I'm gonna use my, my few seconds for that. And I think it, we talked a lot about this, but you know, do the underinvestment, you know, rather than waiting philanthropy, there are groups that are out there that are charting their own path to resource their work in ways that are both more sustainable, but also more empowering in terms of what we've talked about these um, difficult power imbalances in philanthropy. Um, and um, so just drop their links in here. This is Black Feminist Fund, the Trans Justice Funding Project and Fund the South, and just a few of really amazing models of wait for traditional philanthropy. Not surprisingly, this work, they're all at various stages in their development and funding. Um, uh, this is Southern Power Fund, again, Trans Justice Funding Project and Black Feminist Fund, and funding work and moving millions um, in ways that now philanthropy is paying attention. So I think looking at these models, for those of you that are in philanthropy on this webinar right now, um, and, and taking note, and for those of you that are on the fundraising side, is that these things are starting, they are changing, they are shifting the field, they are shifting power, and we need to see more of these efforts, and they need to become more visible to those of you that are trying to unlock resources in, in your communities. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I like the way, I love I love Ricky's synthesis of a previous question that we didn't have time to, to, to touch on, as well as the key takeaways. So Holly, I'd offer you that same opportunity. What are you inspired by? What's exciting you? What do you want to leave us with? I'm inspired by people like Farhad and Lem and people out there who are really trying to think outside of our philanthropic ecosystem to how we can move all of the ability, all of the things that we can move, whether it's where we shop, who we hire, um, where we spend our dollars, um, where we invest our dollars, where we, if we have money to put in a DAF, where we're putting that. The people who are investing in um, giving low bono and free bono interest rates for community-based organizations to buy buildings, like exploding the ideas of capacity building, and um, that really inspires me. And I would, I wish that we could have seen you on this call. I'd love to know more about who's in our audience, but the, I really. Think about the social change ecosystem as a table, and all of us have a seat around this table. The work is really big, so we all need to do what we can to move these values of equity, justice, and fairness forward. Um, so find your seat at the table. We know that seats change and our hats change as our lives change, um, but welcome. We need all of you, so let's build this thing together. Absolutely. Thanks, Holly. Cynthia. What are your final thoughts? Give us the, the benediction, as they say. Oh, the benediction. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, my thoughts on this is I, I too uh, mimic that I wish I could have seen the faces of the folks that we're, we're speaking to. But, you know, communities must take control of the basic pillars of this process. And, you know, communities have to continue uh, in this space to mandate, to look for accountability, and, you know, to look at how important it is for proprietorship to really own the game and, and, and be true to that voice and to the foundations, you know, deploy your teams to the community to feel the pulse, to trust the pulse, and to move forward and take a chapter out of McKenzie's book. It works, it works, it works. And it's really easy to try to script out what one thinks we all need out here, but the problems aren't going away. And 
in my opinion, just keep looking to the community. The community will really guide you and really become one with the community and stop feeling sorry for the community. But the community really has the power to make the change. And if you listen to them, the world will be a much better place. So awesome. thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, it's time for us to wrap up. I'm so sad that our time together is, is over, but Cynthia, Holly, Ricky, thank you, thank you, thank you for your leadership, for your generosity. You all inspire me. Thank you to Imperial Philanthropy. Thank you to NYU. Thank you to our audience out there. Uh, appreciate you all. That is our the end of our time together.